blessed in this, in this book is one of his churches that he, he pioneered. And so we're, we're going to look at that. We'll get to that this morning. But I want to tell you, when you read through the book of Revelations, what you need to understand, and as we do this study, is this book is placed exactly where God wants it in the Scripture. It's the end. And I, I, I'm thinking of Pastor Cluck all the time these days. I've heard him say 10,000 times, I've read the, the final chapter, we win. He's talking about Revelations. You know, we, we, you stay the course, and it's spelled out there, you know, the victory of the church, but lots of stuff is still to come. And uh, the book of Revelations was probably written in 96 A.D. by the Apostle John. He's, he's in his, well up in his 90s, close to 100 years old, as near as we could tell by history. And he's told there in chapter 1 to, uh, to, uh, the, the, to write the things that he sees and hears. And uh, it, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ to the world. It's not John's, you know, personal, uh, he had a dream, tried to figure it out. I uh, just read through Daniel last week, and I'm thinking, you know, all of the mysteries and the deep things that Daniel has to deal with through dreams and, and uh, uh, stories and interpretations he's dealing with. And I'm thinking on that, I'm thinking about the study I'm putting together for Revelations, and I thought, you know, some of this stuff is meant to be exactly that way. Because if we were to open up God's book, read through it, and go, oh, that's it, we'd be done. <laughs> that's human nature. That'd be enough. But when you look into this and you read it again, and you know what? I didn't see that. I don't get that. I have to study further. And that's what uh, God's wisdom applied, the way he gave us his word, is it keeps us going. And so um, here in this book, uh, there's sacred references to things that are presently when John is writing, and things that are to come to pass, you know, things that were actually, is what he's going to be writing about, what you had, the church in Ephesus, they had their first love, they lost it. The other churches, the Lord brings rebuke, we'll study all seven churches, because they're meaningful to us today. But um, it's about things that were, things that are right then, presently, when the writer is writing, and it's about things to come. This is the age right now. When these things are coming, this is it. There's no doubt uh, anybody that opens a Bible and has any relationship with God and any sincerity of heart understands that, and it's the divine program. The order in which these things are to happen, it's come to, it's, it, the final book here and its consummation is in its proper place. It's the, the, the book of Revelations. It spells out things that are the end. And someone said the full book is a book of action. The earth and heaven are brought near together. The clouds roll away. The thrones, the elders, the angelic forms are seen. Harps, trumpets, cities, disembodied souls, choruses sung and heard. All kinds of things are taking place. When you read through the book of Revelations, um, if you've ever tried to just read one chapter, uh, you, you'll just scratch your head when you're done, you know, and maybe read it again again. But uh, I'm going to encourage you to do something. Read through the book of Revelations today, tomorrow, next day or something. You just read it through. And, uh, and then maybe read it through again before next Sunday. And, we'll, and it'll really help put you on the, the, the page we're on as we start uh, learning out of it this week. And so it's a divine book. It's inspired by God. It's spoken by the Lord Jesus. And, um, and I'll tell you, the, the earth touches the heavens in this book. And the heavens are released upon the earth in all kinds of manners. And uh, there's absolute moral contrast in this book. There is absolute good and absolute evil. That's, there's not a middle ground that's compromised. You know, this, and this is really interesting to me, the way this book spells everything out and where it's placed at the consummation of history, was we're nearing the very end, if there ever was a time on earth when people are trying to blur the lines between good and evil, it's right now, big time. And uh, they're try it doesn't matter what good is done in the political arena, there's a whole glob of people that will jump up and scream foul, you know, something good. You, you put the brakes on the abortion industry, and there's a whole portion of people in the world and in the United States that are going to jump up and scream that you don't 
hold any moral values. Wait a minute, I thought we'd put the brakes on something like that, you know, slow it down, and they'll scream foul. So if there ever was a time when these things are blurred, it's now, and yet there is not any blending. Rather, it, what it is is this incredibly sharp contrast between good and evil and, uh, and the victory that, that takes over in the end. And so the, the book is addressed uh, to the seven churches of Asia, and, uh, but it, it's, it's not just, uh, just Asia. This, this is to the, to the whole Western world is what it is and to the world at large. And uh, uh, there were more than seven churches in Asia, you know, and, and the Bible makes that clear. It speaks of church in Colossae, there's a church in Traos, Hierapolis, and uh, when we toured the seven churches, you know, in, in that region, we went on a tour and toured all these places, these locales. There's still much history you can uh, discover when you walk there. Uh, we also went to Hierapolis and uh, Colossae, and there are cities there and remnants of churches, you know. And so there was more than seven. And so just a little background. And give me a little background before we launch here this morning. But the seven that we speak about when we read in Revelations 2 and 3, and uh, they're... As we read, let's, uh, uh, you know, you can ask all the questions you want this morning. It'll make me study harder. Hallelujah. Uh, we'll just keep looking for answers. But um, let's read. And then if you have comments or questions, we will take them and we'll uh, open up for discussion as we go along. I think it's going to prove out to be a very interesting study in our time. Revelations 1, uh, 1 through 8, as we begin. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and that they hear the words of his prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. From him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath, has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Behold, he come with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Okay, so as we read, um, you're going to see things like, here's just the first eight verses, and here is much to contemplate. And he's reading or, or speaking, we're reading what, what's been spoken out, what John's recorded, and here immediately we see Jesus is identifying himself. He's the first, the last, the one who was and is and will always be. You know, he's the one who washed us by his blood. He's the, the owner, the, the, the beginner of the church, the, the one who begat it, the one who keeps it, uh, the one who purchased it with his own blood, and he's bringing forth his credentials. He says, now, look, I have something to say, and I'm the one saying it. And so um, this is what we need to understand when we're reading. It's not just John had a dream, had a thought. It was hope, you know, contemplating, you know, where the church has been, where it's going, what could happen. Jesus has given us some pretty powerful insight into some very important things in, in, that are taking place even in the day in which we live. We can read and learn by history, you know, and that's what we'll do. But we also need to, you know, if you don't learn by history, you're doomed to repeat the problems and mistakes of the past, the errors. And so we're able to learn 
uh, but we're also able to be warned. And, and so here's the description, who's talking to us, and, and this is the greeting of the, uh, uh, that's brought forth by the Lord. And now uh, John uh, speaks on further, this is verse 9 through 20. Uh, and that's Hi. Sheldon. I, John, also am your brother and companion in tribulation. And the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was, I was on in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake unto me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven sticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with white, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird the paps with golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like white, like wool, was, were white like wool, and as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, and if they burned in the furnace. And his voice was the sound of many waters. And he hath in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth at his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. O men, and have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou seest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay, here's uh, chapter one. And uh, this is where we're headed in this study. We're going to dissect this a bit, look at it. And uh, here's Jesus bringing this revelation. He's, he's talking about seven actual churches and seven actual realities of what's happened to churches uh, through the course of history and, and what's happening in, in his day to come. And uh, so, John, you got to remember, is the last apostle, uh, you know, out of the 12, 11, and he's... Um, old, the churches aren't aware of what he's writing at this day, you know. So he's writing about seven actual places that exist. Uh, they're not aware of his writing at this point. He's on the island of Patmos. He's getting this revelation from the Lord. And uh, he writes it down and then sends it off to the churches. So when he received the message, he's a prisoner. And, uh, you know, he, 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 verse 9 there, your brother, companion, in tribulation, and kingdom, and patience of Jesus, I was on the island. It's called Patmos for the word of God, the testimony of the Lord Jesus. So what he's saying uh, is he's there uh, not just evangelizing. John's a prisoner there. And he's locked up. This is a, um, what do you, you know, an island prison, you know, send a guy there, let him. Uh, you know, he's an old man, he's just got to exist there, but he's saying, I was ready when God gave me this, and he begins to write, and he's told uh, that this is the son of man, the one that was, that is, you know, was alive for, this is Jesus talking, uh, speaking to him, and uh, he's told that uh, when we hear, hear uh, some translations have the word, I think uh, Sheldon was reading, was that New King James? That was King James. Okay, New King James is the one that's called not, not candlesticks, but uh, um, lampstands. You know, the, the stand, you know, the candlestick burns down. It's gone. But, so it's kind of a little play on the uh, translation there. But um, the, the lampstands is what he's holding. You know, the, this is what holds up the fire and keeps it going. And, uh, and he's told that the seven stars are angels that are mess, messengers that will minister there to these churches, and, uh, and the lampstand is really the best translation there. It, it really is because it's, it holds the lamp. It keeps it going, holds it up, and uh, we're living 
today in a very interesting time. Through the course of history, okay, there's this first letter, or first warning is to the church in Ephesus. We're going to read all this. I'm just throwing a lot out there this morning to get you thinking, uh, raise some questions, some thoughts, and get us reading in our Bibles. But uh, people have put together a lot of research on this, and that's what I had to go through, uh, to different uh, Bible uh, commentaries, you know, and scholars and books that are written that you that feel you can trust. And uh, because I can't retain everything personally, you know, on this subject, I got to study it up, study it up. And the Ephesus period, they call that, is this, this first little period up until about uh, that end of that first uh, John's period, that, that era. And that's the church that begins to backslide, begins to back the overall church. Then there's another period they call the, the Smyrna period, and that's the persecuted church because the heat got on, you know, and you know, if you know your history, Rome really began to persecute the church, and, and uh, you, 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 you were in danger for your life. You will be a real Christian back then. And many were uh, totally martyred and, and, and paid the price for this. Then they went into the Pergamos period, and it's licentious church, and it found it's a church that spread through. They figured that kind of spirit dominated the church world all the way around the 600s, the 600s. Uh, and so during that time, the church was getting dark. It didn't seem to exist. It was there. There were believers. But um, when we read the rebuke that was given to Pergamos, you know, we begin to see that's the spirit that kind of prevailed through that period. And then you have the, uh, the medieval period, which... We, we know by our history books called medieval. It's called the Dark Ages. And uh, reasons for that is it was very dark in the world because the church just kind of was totally subdued. It, it was a Thyatira period, you know, and it was uh, uh, where the popes, pope them, popes rose up and they took over things, you know, the Roman church. And it just, uh, the word of God was uh, kept in Latin and the people of the world were largely uneducated. On purpose. It's really interesting when you study history. You, you find you, many of you, the first, older folks, I would say, you know, that had real history in school. Um, you know, we remember those terms, dark ages, medieval, different words like that, and uh, papal influence, et cetera. And, uh, and, and we know when we study and we go back in time, we find out, you know, a lot of things that happen in this world are on purpose, folks. <laughs> There's a real enemy of mankind. And men for long periods of time were without books, were without the ability to read. And they were called just peasants and peons. And you had hierarchy that ruled, you know, everywhere. And, and, and then you had the influence of the Roman Catholic Church for centuries from Rome. They ruled, the, they appointed kings. They, they set things in order in the whole world. It was the ruling class. And it was a very, very dark dark period. It was called the Papal Church and in, in, in the Dark Ages, and it was a wicked time. And then along the end of that period, into the uh, 1400s, 1500s, you know, Wycliffe, Luther, Luther these other great uh, men of God and visionaries and men that got born again and men that had the capability to read and study, begin to translate and look at the, the Latin and uh, realize it was not just meant to be kept away from the common man and uh, education begin to be promoted where people could read. The main reason mankind came to its, uh, its senses with the ability to read was to pursue God. Not just to learn to read, write, and do arithmetic, and make money. Yeah. Our American universities, for crying out loud, they were all started every, I think the first three or four, ex absolutely without doubt, were started because there were people in the leadership roles in America that were nervous that Americans were going to begin to forego education and not be able to read their Bible. Because there was a new land, and it's opened up, there was prosperity, the blessings of God on our nation were evident, people were prospering. And we had lots of people, Christian influence in the Congress, our Senate back then, did people developing the nation, uh, our leaders, that begin to think within themselves, this is, this is even back in the 1700s, whatever it was, that, you know, our people need to learn to read so they can, and you know what the book was in the schools, the universities, the Bible, the big book. And everything was taught from that way out, from the Bible-centered. And so 
uh, the world began to open up, and then they went into what they called the Sardis period, and it was basically a dead church. It's church, you know, the buildings were there, the, the, the title church, the cross on the building, the steeples, uh, pe- people, it's like today, you know, lots of people uh, think they're just fine because they have a church. Uh, they don't go there because it's in another state, you know. Uh, they believe in God, but, you know, you wouldn't know it to know them. Uh, they're dead spiritually. And this went in, into uh, a great period of time. Then there's the Philadelphia period. They figure this to be the 1800s. Revivals begin to break out. It, when you study through history, th- these things coincide amazingly. And uh, we know there were great revivals, even the revivals that swept into America. It was a favored church. And then the Laodicea period is what they figured has come uh, into being in the last century or so. And that is just a lukewarm church. You do got lots of people still in America who, who will attend a church. You can attend our church and be lukewarm. You can go anywhere and be lukewarm. You can be, call yourself a Christian and be lukewarm all day long, anywhere, anybody can. And that's kind of where we think we are today. And I tell you, there's only one thing left on that prophetic scale, and that's the rapture. I mean, the one thing that matters most to us. We be ready for that, and we gather in as many as we can to the ark, you know, or the ship, the church. So when Christ comes... Uh, we'll be ready and those that he wants to bring with us. So uh, this is where these scriptures lead us to, to see history and to see where we are today and where we could be going. And, um, and so in the first few books, uh, the first few chapters, uh, we'll talk about these things, the things past. Things that you've seen, John, you know, write about the things you've seen, things that you know. And the vision of Christ, that, those lampstands. What, what, what's a lampstand for? To give light. You know, it's got to be operable or it's, you know, what good is a lampstand in your closet? You know, it's something that's useful, needs to be used. And that's the church. And the Lord says, I got them in my hand. And, I, you know, he can do what he wants with them, and he wants to bring life. And this is one of the interesting things I found as I've been reading through and studying these churches for weeks on end now is there's always a big-time rebuke that is necessary, and there's always an open door. Come on. Come back. Get it right. Let me lift you up. Let's make the difference. Let's put the lampstand back where it belongs. And so I believe with all my heart there's a lot of hope for the world still today, in this crisis hour, I think that the church can rise up. It's going to take people that are not lukewarm, people that are not backslidden, people who can withstand some persecution. All these things are what we see in these uh, warnings. We need people who are not licentious. They, they know how to control their, their carnal appetites in this hour where anything goes. Uh, it, it's you know, people who refuse to be a lax church, just church attenders. Or a dead church. And the rebuke the Lord gives says, you say you're alive, but you're dead. And that, that's the, you know, that's mind-boggling to me. Because, like I said, in this book of Revelations, there is one extreme and another extreme. How many of you know life and death are two absolute extremes? Once it's dead, it's gone. You know, it's, it's, you, you've had perhaps family members, friends, loved ones, you've been there, you've seen that transpire, and once the life is gone out of that body, I've heard a bunch of people now in my days, I don't know how many people have said how they looked on that body and said things, just like text I got the other day when Pastor Mitchell passed on, the only words were, he's gone, I knew what that means, he's not there. That body is just a body. It's dead. And to to have this absurdity of of mind to say, hey, we're kicking it. We're alive. And then Jesus says, no, dead. That's two pretty pretty extreme um, polarizing things, you know. And so we have to be a people that will lay hold of like the Philadelphia. God says, I'm opening a door. You got it. If you want it, take it. Open the doors open. Get the work done. 
And then the other warning, of course, is for the lukewarm church. So if we're going to have and be a part of this great thing, which is coming, and I think we're on the threshold of, then we absolutely have to uh, heed these warnings we find. And we'll find them. Amen. Any comments or questions as we mosey along here? Anybody? I feel like a school teacher when I'm like trying to open this lesson up and teach it. But Tom? It, it almost seems like we're going back into the dark ages again. Our education system has kids that can't even read or write now. And uh, never less school books, but their Bibles as well. Yep. They can text in abbreviated forms. And how many of you know Antifa tried burning down a couple libraries already for crying out loud? Libraries, where books are, you know. And this is one of the uh, things in the communist uh, manifesto. This is uh, right at the root of, of that wickedness, is destroy history. So God told John, write about things that were, they are, and the things to come. You don't forget the history. Uh, Kevin? Yeah, just um, just for clarity, um, so you said the Lodice, uh, Lodicea church, that's kind of the time we're in right now. Is that is that what you're saying? Or? Um, I think every one of these, this is the interesting thing. And when you're looking at these, the revelations that are here, it it's not just, okay, all of those periods came and went. They came and went, but they are presently active. I mean, they, they came and went in the sense they're not the dominant thing. They just kept going. They kept going. You know, uh, the backslidden church didn't backslide in any way. No, but no longer. No, there's still people of that nature. The persecuted church, you know, people that uh, would stand. They, they were, and there's still people that are standing. They, the licentious church, you know, the carnal church. They, they, they didn't just stop being carnal. No, it's still there. And so, you know, there's the interesting thing about all of this, the lax church, the dead church, the favored church, the, uh, the lukewarm church, those were definite periods of time, and they still go on. It didn't just, oh, that was then, this is now. Though it's there, they just bled into the next and the next and the next. And then the other amazing thing is these were actual places. So, I mean, you know, it's amazing how the Lord does stuff. And brings us revelation. And this is why it's so good to uh, force ourselves at times to study and read. Um, I told you all the story. One, one time I was finishing up my yearly Bible reading plan. I was on a flight. And uh, I used to read out of my, my uh, paper Bibles. Remember my leather bound? They're all faded out and shredded these days. I just mostly used e-Bible. Which is okay. It's not sacrilege. Amen. You know, it's Bible. Hallelujah. And, and so I would carry my Bible all the time. I'd be on an airplane. I'd be reading. I, I love to read scripture when I'm sitting alone and nothing disturbing me. And, uh, and so we're having the worst turbulence I ever was in for a plane trying to make a landing. It was incredible. I mean, you know, stewardesses are vomiting. Things are happening, you know. Uh, I'm trying to finish my yearly Bible plan. I'm in Revelations 20. I just got, I just, I'm thinking, man, I want to finish on this trip. And there's this guy sitting next to me. I did try to witness to him. We started and stuff. He, he, you know, he's cool. You know, he's cool. And, uh, and I'm reading and I'm hanging on to the, the, you know, to my seat thing. And gosh, man, my Bible page flips. I turn back. Finally, we start just kind of, we're, we're just about to taxi. We're almost there. And the plane's still doing this number. And this guy goes, finally, he screams out, do you got to be reading that? I said, I, I, what? And he goes, that, revelations. Like, it's a scary thing, you know. And we're, look what we're going through. And uh, I said, you got a seatbelt on. You'd be okay. I, mean, I don't know. You know, people are strange, man, when it comes to stuff like this. But the book of Revelations is not a spooky book. It's a book of Revelation. It's stuff we, we need to be aware of, and it needs to awaken us. Uh, to the hour we're in. And so this that's a good question, Kevin. This is not just this period of a lukewarmness. All of these other things, they, they just kept right on going. And today, I think all of these things are loose in the Christian world to some degree or another, and it's the danger we face if we're not on our toes. And so we can learn from each of these. Anybody else? Comment or questions? Good one. Anybody? Okay, we want to read... Um, I gave out uh, Revelations 4.1, right? Somebody? Jeff? 
After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet, taking, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be thereafter. Okay, so chapter 1 is kind of an opening. Thank you. for. And number 2 and 3 are all of the insight into these seven churches and the things. And then chapter 4 is, is the further vision that he carries on through the rest of the book. And it connects the first part with the... It's very interesting. If you really study this out, the message to the seven churches are kind of inserted in between two visions. One, the vision of Christ in chapter 1, and then the, uh, uh, the four and 20 elders. You get all the way there as you move through Revelations. You, you're all the way to heaven. You're down here on the earth with Jesus speaking. You're you know, bringing revelation to things that are, things that are going to come, but then it connects you all the way to the final final uh, bit of the glorified church with the Lord and called out and caught up and, and in heaven. And that's why Brother Cluck used to always say, I've read the last chapter, we win. We're going. It's a glorious thing. So you have lots in Revelations. And if you just read a chapter here, a chapter there, a chapter there, that's better than not reading it, for sure. Then if you just read it through, you're still not going to just go, oh, I see, he was there, and we're here, you know. But uh, it's just very, very good to make yourself look into this, and especially now, and teach on it for a few weeks. You'll come up with questions. We'll sort together, uh, ask God's grace, look for answers, and God will help us. But here he's saying, um, John says, I looked again. Now I'm, 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 uh, I'm caught up a little further, and here's a... Uh, a, a come up here, come on up here. I'll show you things that are coming hereafter. So he's connecting, and uh, most people that really research this book, Bible scholars, commentators, teachers, uh, it's almost a consensus, you know, that you've got that first chapter, the revelation of Christ. You have him bringing the, uh, um, the you know, the insight into who he is. You have then the words to the churches, and then you have the, you know, you're up in heaven. You make it all the way up through the stuff that's coming into heaven. And uh, I gave out First Thessalonians. I want to read that this morning. We're going to barely just open up the book of uh, Ephesians in a minute, you know, the letter to the, but uh, First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, Wally. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, and you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. So you probably are all familiar with that. That is the, uh, the promise of being caught up to be with the Lord, the rapture of the church. It's, it's coming, uh, probably coming sooner than we'd ever it's amazing. I, I thought in my early days as a Christian 40 years ago, we'd never have another New Year celebration. We'd be gone. You know, and then you, just, you, you get older and you go along in life. And uh, I was talking to a brother the other day. He said, man, he just always assumed Pastor Mitch would, we'd all be going up together. And he went ahead the way of all the earth. And, um, you know, Jesus said, no man knows that day and that hour. But here, the Bible speaks of the reality of this coming to pass. We will be caught up. We will ascend. And as I just said, um, we look at um, the things which are. That includes chapters 2 and 3. Remember when he's speaking about the condition of those churches there, but there's still more to come. And uh, this is a prophetic outline of spiritual history. And from the ch church time, that is about... It's about 96 A.D. when John wrote this, when God gave it to him. And then you have chapter 2 and 3. Then 
you read through Revelations, and I think Jeff read in chapter 4, verse 1, 1 and 2 there, but from there on, you don't see the church again, not until you get way towards the end of the book. It's taken up. It's out of the picture. You're reading about all the stuff that's coming down on the earth. That's a period of time you and I don't want to be here. And that is a time of wicked tribulation and judgment. And the church disappears after chapter 3. There's the speaking to it, the rebukes to it, uh, you know, the, 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 the words to the uh, uh, um, um, Laodicean church. And then, you know, no more church in the book of Revelation until you get way towards the end. And, and then you'll see those people Jeff read about caught up in heaven. And uh, this is where we're headed, folks. And the early church um, got the message, you know, these letters were written, they were sent back out, and uh, these are seven distinct churches, seven periods of time, and they are words that are very pertinent and important to the church world today. Absolutely. Anybody comment, question? That's good. Everybody has all the answers already. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We want to read Revelations 2. Here's our uh, first church, the church of Ephesus. Uh, and this is chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. And how thou hast cast not bare them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has, has I labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works of else or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place and accept thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay, and as we'll find in these uh, rebukes, there's, there's actual problems, trouble. Remember, this is coming from the Lord Jesus. He can see. He is fully aware, and he's speaking of very uh, actual realities and conditions of heart and the way the people are, and yet he always extends still the hand of redemption. And uh, it's a very important to keep in mind as we read through. Um, what comes to your mind when, uh, you know, he's, he's speaking to them, I know, I know, uh, verse 2, your works, your labor, your patience, <clears throat> you have a hard time. You can't bear those that are evil. Uh, you tested those who say they're apostles and they're not. You found them labor or liars, and you persevered. You had patience. You labored for my namesake and, and uh, have not become weary. You're saying, man, you guys, that sounds pretty good. They, 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 they want to be a right church. They want to be a strong church. They want to make a stand, this, that, the other. But yet he says, wait a minute, there's something wrong, and you've, you've lost something here. You left your first love. That's verse 4. How, isn't that something, you know, that he looks at this, and here's human nature. We pride ourselves. You know, I, I mean, I've had... I know people that have the most kinky doctrine. It's, it's a doctrine of uh, works and religiosity and uh, their keeping of the law, boy, and ain't nobody righteous but them. And they, I know people, they, I've had it preached to me. I've had them send me video links and books. <laughs> and yet, I'm wondering, where's their love for God? Because if you're going to love God, you might have to love something else. Anybody know what that is? People. <laughs> and yet, I, these are like the Pharisees Jesus rebuked. They make it impossible for people to get in their church. You know? Impossible. And yet, they, and so here's these guys. 
they are, boy, they, they got it going on. They, they give you a test to see if you're a real apostle. They, you know, they, they want your credentials. They, they work you over. And they persevere. Uh, they labor. They didn't become weary, but they lost or left off their first love. And uh, what the Lord points to, as we have already said, remember from where you've fallen. Get, get right back. And I've said it in a thousand sermons and teachings over the years. Sometimes you've got to retrace your steps a little bit. Back where you left off, you know, back to an altar, back to what needs to be done. And the first love uh, is, is it, it means, the, the, the rebuke here for the Ephesians means to let go or relax. You know, this is not the issue anymore. You know how to walk. You know what the rules are. You know what how a Christian looks on the outside. You know when it's time to be in church. You know you shouldn't do that. You know, you know. And that's becoming lax with the love. And we need to do what we do because we love God. And, uh, and, and so this is uh, uh, writing to a church, you know, where John pastored up in this region. But also it had become a backslidden church. And Paul, the apostle, is the one who founded this church up there in Ephesus. And he warned about this. It's very interesting. When Paul was leaving the region of Ephesus, he gave them a stern warning. If you remember reading in Acts, I gave it to Lee, chapter 20, verse 29 and 30. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men rise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Okay, well, in verse 31, I should have gave you that. Therefore, watch, remember that for the three years, I didn't cease to warn you, every, everyone, day and night with tears. Uh, the apostle saying, after I'm gone, you, you, you watch out, grievous wolves. And what did the, the Lord say? He said, I know you hate the works of the Nicolaitans. And if you research who these Nicolaitans are, they're some of the folks that probably spearheaded this whole mentality of clergy and the papal Institute, you know, from the Pope, the highest of, of all, infallible, and then his cardinals, and then uh, the local bishops, and then the priests, you know, and all these are, and the rest of y'all were just laity, were nobodies, you know. And this is probably those very people. Uh, the word Nico uh, means to uh, uh, conquer or overthrow, and, uh, and, and the word Laos, the people are laity. So the Nicolaitans. These were people that had it in them to become holier than thou. No wonder when he's bringing the rebuke, he, he, he's, he's saying, you guys are, man, you're a boy, you got uh, law, you know, you got order, you, don't, you hate certain things, you know what is right and what is wrong and, and all this. Well, maybe some of that Nicolaitans teaching bled over, you know, that they're holier than thou. And, uh, and Paul uh, said wolves they're like wolves man they'll get in there and if you know uh, any stories from the time you can remember in life we know about the wolves in sheep's clothing best way for a wolf to get his job done find his way in the mix you know and so they were not a sect but a kind of a party in the church that, that was referring back to perhaps the, the priestly order of the Jews you know, and trying to reestablish something like that, and people that are holier than others, special, they got it going on. And, uh, and so, it, it, holy men, you know, and, and then the rest would be laity. And so, we probably, right there is where this whole thing comes from, that uh, much of the Catholic church world went on to be. And so, the Lord says, you know what, uh, get rid of all that stuff and come back to something that's most critical and that is your first love real easy to get to fall out of that isn't it it is really easy to know what you need to do and just get busy and do it real easy to get busy living life and still love god and know about god and be honor god but then we're busy and uh you know personal things take a hit um i i did uh i did lots of Forced reading yesterday, in my study time, I just read my Bible. 
you know, as I didn't read as much as I wanted to this week, and I, um, you know, I, I, I have to read it because I find Christ in the scriptures. He finds me. And I find, you know, my walk with him is, is enhanced. And, you know, my love for God. It's not just because I was doing this study, but uh, this is something that's absolutely important, man. Do not lose the first love. And if you have, the good news is Jesus says, come back. Reignite it. Get it back. Things you know you, you should be doing, used to do. And well, that was like you're saying, that was a lot of work. These guys did all the work. No, no, no. They, he, he didn't rebuke them, tell them, you better stop judging hypocrisy. You better stop hating the work of those. Nick, like, he didn't tell them nothing like that. He said, you're doing all these things, great, but there's something critical missing. The first love. We got any comments or questions? We got just a minute or two. We'll, Anybody have anything? And we'll have to take a pause till next week on the study. Okay, praise the Lord. Let's take a, just a quick break. Five minutes, we'll start church this morning. Praise God.